Well, uh, we have a lot of questions to be able to move through here, and uh, uh, feel free, though, for, for several of you to answer and chime in and augment and color in different aspects of this. Uh, just a quick question here as we start, start off and uh, just asking about uh, books and authors that you are reading, particularly recognizing the place of the Bible in spiritual formation, what books or authors are currently informing your love for Christ and your walk of discipleship? So, uh, Michael? I really enjoy reading a scholar named Desmond Alexander, and uh, he really uh, is doing wonderful work in biblical theology. A lot of what you've heard today, tracing through Adam all the way to the new Adam, and um, uh, all of his work so far really just uh, feed my love for Christ. And I might also add that uh, we have the privilege of hosting him here uh, soon for the Doctorate of Ministry program. He'll be teaching a class, and we're just excited uh, for him to give this good theology and the underpinning uh, for solid biblical preaching. So, uh, but he is someone who just makes Scripture come alive. So, he's an author that I would certainly recommend. Amen. Um, for myself, lately it's been uh, Graham Goldsworthy and, and Dennis Johnson have been very helpful um, uh, as of late for me. I, I offer two names. Uh, one, I've been doing some reading on, on biblical theology, uh, and as someone other than me has quipped in that particular area, uh, Voss is boss. Uh, so I've been reading Gerhardus Voss and very blessed to be doing so. The other is actually, a, 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 at this point, a, a modern classic. Uh, one of my classes at Reformation Bible College, uh, actually our Doctrine of Man class, uh, we're reading together through uh, Desiring God by John Piper. Uh, and yeah, we're uh, getting a good shout out there for Dr. Piper, and uh, we're, we're all uh, being blessed uh, with his wisdom there. Homer Kelly. Homer Kelly. Could you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> He wrote the golfing machine. <laughs> he, he has a, a, the most in-depth study of the mechanics and physics of the golf swing ever written. Yes. There will be a new Homer Kelly coming soon, I'm sure. <laughs> and you find your devotional life enhanced on the golf course. <laughs> I didn't hear him. What did he say? He said, you find your devotional life enhanced by this, but I think he's implying that you're devoted to something wrong. <laughs> R.C., let me come back to you now with this question. Um, it's a question of reflection. If you could restart your ministry over again, is there anything you would do differently? How much time do you have? <laughs> Probably the thing I'd do most differently was uh, get in the pulpit a whole lot earlier in my life than I did. I was ordained originally to the teaching ministry, not to the pulpit ministry. That came much later. But that's been the joy of my life, is to be able to be in this pulpit here at St. Andrews. That's the main thing I'd do differently, probably. I, I, I would speak to that, though I'm not <clears throat> as old as some others. Um, I, when I look back at the early years and opportunities that I had to teach, uh, there's a great deal of uh, embarrassment, uh, not over any of the things that I believed. Uh, I, I think that when I first started, like a lot of people, I spent far much too much time talking about and speaking to the errors of those that were farthest away from me, that uh, the things that I was right about were things that I was proud of, and I'm speaking into people who share the same convictions with me about these people that are out there, and that's really a waste of time. 
You know, I, I feel like first what I need to do is be thinking about my sins, not the sins of broader evangelicalism and in terms of my own spiritual growth. But in the end, I also think that's what we need to be teaching, that we need to be speaking about our weaknesses. And, uh, you know, one of those is the very pride that leads us to talking bad about other people. Reverend Bauckham. Boy, I would, I would change much. Um, I, would, I would change much of the time that I spent in training and the places um, that I received that training. Um, I've found that much of the time that I've spent since my training has been an effort to, to, to backfill. Um, and I, 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 I would be a much better steward of that time as it relates to where and with whom I, I study. Well, I don't have a lot of the history under my belt and experience, but um, I pastored for about four years in Northeast Tennessee, and then I've been associate pastor, but I've been really doing a lot of teaching um, while being associate pastor. But when I look back to those former years, what I've, one of the things that I've learned is, and that I wish I could go back and, and change, is to be in the homes more. Um, always, by God's grace, loved the Word and um, ministering the Word. But I've come to see now by experience of uh, the way that the Word is applied in the homes. Uh, you just, there's no escaping the role of the shepherd. And really, uh, to be a shepherd and, and, and to be there among the flock and with the people even changes the way they receive the Word uh, from the pulpit. And uh, so that is something I've, I've learned from uh, great pastors that the Lord has uh, brought in my life since then and that I would certainly strive to do if the Lord brought me back uh, into the pastorate. Question that I'm going to put out there, and you'll understand after I ask it why I'm just going to put this out there. And uh, whoever wants to step up to the plate uh, can take a swing. If the state or federal government passed a law requiring you to officiate and recognize same-sex marriages, how would you respond? No. <laughs> and perhaps to expand on that, why would you respond? That <laughs> There's a, uh, an ancient tr tradition that is illustrated in the book of Acts that holds that Christians have an obligation to obey those in authority over them until those in authority over them require them to uh, do what God clearly forbids or forbid them to do what God clearly commands. And that clearly there is important. You can't, you can't not like it, decide it's not wise, and then stand your ground like Martin Luther and not do it just because it doesn't look like the best choice. It's got to be a clear violation of the Word of God. Uh, where it gets tricky and fuzzy is when the state claims for itself uh, a level of authority where it doesn't belong. That is, I, I would argue that if the state required that I preach from the book of First Timothy, that I might just have a duty to disobey, not because God requires me not to preach from First Timothy but that God requires me to recognize the Lordship of Christ over that pulpit and not the Lordship of the federal government. I think there's a tension, and I, I talk to people on both sides of the issue. I think that, that as Reformed people, as often Scottish people, we are too ready to draw our swords when we should be humbly going to Caesar and say, you tie me to that stake, I'm ready to go. On the other hand, we also are the other way where we are willing to allow the state to intrude where it doesn't belong. So I, I think that these kinds of questions involve a great deal of wisdom. The example that you give there makes it easy. 
uh, I think, but there are others, other places that are far more likely to happen uh, that we, we are facing. Now, I will say this, in Canada, if I understand the Canadian law correctly, even in the pulpit, if you preach that homosexuality is a sin, you can be charged with a crime. If that's true, I don't know for sure if that's exactly how it's been worded, but if that's true, then, then I would… I don't understand why there isn't weekly national homosexuality is a sin week in those pulpits. I, I would expect every evangelical to stand up and preach the text, preach it faithfully, preach the gospel, and say to the state, you come and get me because I'm preaching the Word. And Vody, once Texas secedes, obviously this won't be a, an issue, right? <laughs> you know, that, yeah, I want to, I, but see, the plan is more complicated than that. We, we, have to get, we have to get Governor Perry to be the President of the United States so that he goes to Washington and then we secede because he already said he thinks it's okay. So, uh, I think if that happened, Vody's response would be, call the ambulance. <laughs> 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 this next question involves a family split, but a split over doctrine. What is the best approach of a family that is split in doctrine between the husband and wife where young children are involved in order to maintain that cohesive family unit? And they give the example of Roman Catholicism and Reformed theology. What would be your pastoral counsel to that family that has that tension within it? Wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the Word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. That would be my that would be my um, admonition. And the rest of that passage goes on to talk about Sarah and how she obeyed Abraham, and I think significantly um, speaking about her there in Genesis chapter 20, which is beyond just like, I think this might be a bad decision on his part. Um, but the crux of the matter is faith. It says don't have any fear. Um, we, we, we have to believe that doing what God says that we're to do in the way that God says that we're to do it uh, puts us in a position where God will vindicate himself and we don't have to vindicate ourselves on his behalf. You mentioned, you didn't say who was who here, whether it was the husband was Catholic and the wife wasn't or whatever. Because that could get really, really complicated because R.C. has already given us the principle we must obey authorities over us unless they command us to do something God forbids or forbids us from doing something God commands. And if you have a situation there where the husband, say, is Roman Catholic and he requires his wife and children to go to the Roman Catholic Church, I would say it would be the duty of the wife to disobey him because he was trying to… Uh, force her to go to an apostate body and the children. And I think she, she can't do that. She's just not allowed to do that. And that would be, uh, would put a severe strain on the marriage. And if she had to disobey, she should still be a loving, kind, generally submissive wife and follow the practical advice that we've already heard. But this is a matter of conscience here. How in the world? Uh, I mean, like, I could not, in good conscience, ever participate in a Roman Catholic Mass, even if it was my best friend's wedding and it was a nuptial Mass. I couldn't do it. Why? Because I understand the theology of it. Now, most people don't, and they go in there, they don't even know what's going on. But if you understand the theology of what's going on there and participate in it, Gracious, you know. 
Uh, to me, I would be denying the faith. I would be denying the gospel if I went in there. So, yeah, or like a particular act of blasphemy. Yes. Could you help us to understand how a sinner who is dead in sins and trespasses and wholly incapable of exercising saving faith in Christ is nevertheless held accountable for his unwillingness to repent and believe, which faith and repentance he is unable of his own to exercise? Or how can God judge someone as guilty for that which they are inherently incapable of performing? Perhaps Paul's answer is the most fitting, and his response is simply, who are you, O oh man, to shake a fist at God? Um, I think that's the first humbling answer, uh, but then we move beyond that, I think, and we can explain that while those of us who are saved, uh, it's by the mercy of God, that doesn't mean that those of us who are guilty uh, before we're saved or if we're not saved at all, that we're not accountable and responsible to God. Um, we are, of course, guilty under Adam's sin, but then we also um, exasperate that guilt, multiplying our own sins. And the fact that God doesn't decide to apply the blood of Christ to wash them away doesn't by any means mean that we are suddenly not accountable. And I think, um, Dr. Sproul, your story of, um, I think, being a professor and giving grace until grace is expected is probably the classic story uh, to illustrate that. Well, and there's also the story that God came down, to, if God would come to me and say, I want you to cut the grass this afternoon, and if you don't, I'm going to punish you because you're obligated to do what I commanded you to do. And I said, yes, Lord. And he said, now, you see that big pit over there? And I said, yes. He says, we stay out of that pit. Because if you go in the pit, you're not going to be able to get out, and you're not going to be able to get the job done that I gave you to do. And I said, okay. So as soon as the Lord leaves, I run over and jump in the pit. And then he comes back and he says, why didn't you cut the grass? So I said, how do you expect me to cut the grass when I'm in this pit? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, a contemporary version of the fall, is that we are in a state of moral inability because of our being unified with our father Adam. And we fell in Adam, and that we are therefore responsible for our own moral inability to come. So that once we are in sin and dead in sin, God owes us nothing except judgment. And anything we get apart from judgment is sheer grace. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. If God came to me and the grass wasn't cut, if He punished me, I would have to say, I have every right to be punished. If He, said, if he pardoned me, it would be pure grace. But He doesn't owe it to me. The minute we think that God owes us grace, we no longer understand what grace is, because by definition, it's not owed. It's free and voluntary, unmerited kindness. Before we, before we come to you, Dr. Sproul, Jr., um, how many of you have heard or haven't heard Dr. Sproul's illustration of the, uh, the classroom experience and grace and justice? Have not heard. Oh. Have not heard. Okay. Could you tell us? I don't know what you're talking about. Not the grace. <laughs> you know what you, 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 your papers are doing this day, and if you don't get them… Oh, you mean from holiness and justice about yeah. that story? Yeah. Oh, you want me to go over that real fast? Yeah. That was when I was teaching. This was back in 1966. I was teaching in a college. I was the professor of Bible. I had 250 freshman students in, in the freshman class taking introduction to the Old Testament. The first day of class, I went over the syllabus and I said, we're going to have three short papers, five to eight pages in the course of the semester. First one's due October 1st, second one November 1st, third one December 1st. And I said, unless you're, there's a death in the immediate family or you're confined to the infirmity for illness, if you're not in, if it's not on my desk by 12 o'clock on the 1st, uh, you get an F for that uh, portion of the grade. Does everybody understand? Yes. So October the 1st came, and 
225 students came in with their paper, 25 didn't, and they were standing there terrified. And they said, oh, Dr. Sproul, we failed to make the adjustment to college and we didn't budget our time. Please don't give us an F. And I said, okay, I'll give you two more days to get your paper done, but don't ever do this again. Oh, no, we won't. November came along and 200 students came in with their paper and 50 didn't have them. And I said, where's your papers? And they said, Oh, it was mid. It was uh, midterm, uh, homecoming weekend, and we had all these other things to do for the other classes. We're so sorry. Please, please forgive us and let us have another chance. And I said, "Okay, but this is the last time." And they started to sing spontaneously. I'll never forget it. We love you, Prof. Sproul. Oh, yes, we do. And I was <laughs> Mr. Popularity on the faculty, and that popularity lasted until the first of December. <laughs> when on the 1st of December came, 150 students come with their paper and 100 don't. And I looked out and I said, where are these papers? And this one student, I'll never forget, he was coming back a book, and he said, oh, don't worry about it, Prof, we'll have it for you in a couple of days. I said, Johnson, you don't have your paper? And he said, no, and I took out the black book and I wrote F. And there was this hue and cry immediately, and they shouted with one voice, that's not fair. I said, what did you say? <laughs> he said, I said, that's not fair. I said, oh, Johnson, it's justice that you want. He said, yes. I said, okay. Don't I recall that you were not on time in November, on November 1st was your paper? And he said, that's right. I said, okay, I'm going to give you justice. I'm going to go back and change your grade there to an F. I said, okay, now, who else wants justice? <laughs> and nobody volunteered. <laughs> See, what happens is when we first receive grace, we're overwhelmed with appreciation. We are amazed by grace. The second time, we tend to take it for granted. By the third time, we demand it. And the moment we think that God owes us grace, as I said a moment ago, that should be a bell going off in our head to saying, I'm not thinking about grace anymore because God never owes me grace. He never owes you grace either. But that, that was a real event. That wasn't just a, an illustration. Just going back to uh, Michael's answer on the question, um, I wanted to give a little bit more of the actual text here because it's a fascinating thing. I love when I get that question because it's one of very few questions that I receive that are directly asked by, in Scripture. Take that question, and is that not a, a, a precise paraphrase of what Paul says? He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness in God? This is after Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Is there unrighteousness in God? Certainly not, for he says to Moses… I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the Scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens." That's what raises the question. So Paul gives us the question. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Isn't that what you asked? Why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? He is the Lord of space and time. He controls all things. How, we we had, didn't have a chance at the beginning. Who can resist his will? The fascinating thing about God's answer, as Michael pointed out, is it's really not an answer. God's answer is, I'm God, okay? You belong to me. I can do with you what I will. You're clay. I'm a potter. And my goal, my desire is to manifest my glory. I will share it with no other. 
Again, this is what I was trying to say this morning as well. If this is something you cannot swallow, then you do not know the living God. This is who He is. Now, it doesn't make it easy to swallow. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, and God is gracious and slow to anger, but you've got to face the fact that this is what it says. Now, I don't want to ever encourage people to do what I call dueling verses with our Arminian friends where we say, what about this text? And they say, what about that text? And we see who builds the bigger pile fastest. But I will say, if you're ever going to deal with your Arminian friend, take them here to this text, Romans chapter 9, and ask them, please, please help me understand how any of this makes any sense in the way you understand things. Stay with this text and explain it to me from your perspective. I had friends who, who uh, transferred into our church in Virginia after they went, their church was con committed to expositional preaching. Their pastor preached in the book of Romans. They started in Romans 1. They went to Romans 2. They went all the way through to Romans 7. And they showed up the next week and the pastor said, turn to your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. <laughs> you can't do it. At least he knew that. <laughs> Why do sinners suffer for eternity while Christ and His substitutionary atonement did not suffer for eternity? If Christ is of infinite value, if He suffers the wrath of God for one second, he's, His suffering is of infinite value. And, and, and here's the, the down part about hell is that if a sinner suffers eternity in hell, and eternity never ends, there's no way that if eternity keeps going and going and going and going and going and going, that that sinner can ever suffer infinitely. He can never fully satisfy the debt he owes God even with an eternity in hell. Does that make sense? I mean, because, but we don't really, we always as human beings stand on the side of our fellow human beings. If they're impenitent sinners, and we're penitent sinners, at least we're both sinners, we have that in common, we can understand our brother or our fellow uh, person who's not a, our spiritual brother and say there but for the grace of God go I. But until we're glorified in heaven, we're never going to fully identify with the glory of God. We're always going to be inclined to have our sympathy with our fellow suffering human beings rather than have any real delight in the vindication of God's holiness. See, we're, the most sanctified person in this world is still much closer to Adolf Hitler than he is to Jesus in terms of his morality. That's what we don't get, that vast gap in holiness between who God is and who I am. And we don't understand the gravity of our sin. And if the Spirit of God were to reveal the full gravity of my sin to me tonight, I, I would die. I couldn't handle it. Fortunately, He's gracious and slowly brings me to conformity to the image of Christ. And in, in the meantime, I'm still in sin. And so, I, the one thing, I, I don't want to, I can't stand the thought of anybody being in hell forever, except for one person, me. I know that if I heard that verdict and God said to me, you go to hell forever, I would be crushed, I would be very unhappy, but I could not say that's not fair. I know that, couldn't do it. And 
That's why nothing less than the perfect sacrifice of one whose person is of infinite value availed for me. Without it, I've got nothing. And this is why I, I, live, I can't stand it with my friends that aren't Christians, and I know their destiny is hell if they don't come to Christ. And uh, I've, never, I've never been able to get over, to get past that. It's a horrible thought. A couple of weeks ago, in my great works class, we were talking, as I mentioned, about Parmenides and Heraclitus, and my son, who's a freshman at RBC, asked this deeply and profoundly astute question that just gave me this unbelievable thrill. And I wanted to share it with him, and I was trying to communicate to him, saying, son, you, that question was just perfect. It was just wonderful. It was so awesome. I went to his grandfather and said, you wouldn't believe what Campbell asked me today. Class, it was so great. I was so excited about it. And that ex I wanted him to have the experience that I had when I asked him that question. When I was a younger man, I remember asking my father that question, and I remember how highly he praised me for asking that question. So let me pass that on to whoever asked that question. It's a wonderful question, wonderful answer. I only want to add one potential uh, addition and, and maybe one reiteration of, of the principle, that the suffering of Jesus is of infinite value because of the incarnation, because this is God and man together. And if you want to, if you want to turn the whole thing into math, that's how you get your equal over equal, which equals one, okay? I mean, infinite over infinite, which equals one. Absolutely true. That said, one of the great horrors about hell that we don't often think about is this. When, when a person goes to hell, they go to hell as a person. And when they go to hell as a person, they go to hell as a person without the grace of God. They don't go saying to God, well, that's fair. <laughs> They go weeping, gnashing their teeth, grumbling, complaining. They continue to offend the holy and righteous God forever. They continue to sin and store up wrath forever. So there's no one in hell still trying to pay off the first cookie out of the cookie jar alone. They are still trying to do that because that's infinitely wrong. But ever since then, they've been stealing cookies from the cookie jar and every other vile and heinous sin imaginable to man. A question of definition. The word orthodoxy is mentioned in different contexts, uh, some confusion perhaps over the word orthodoxy. What is the basic meaning of that word? Well, orthodoxy refers to historic Christianity. Um, we have creeds, uh, as was mentioned this morning, Deuteronomy, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And uh, we hear the uh, apostles speaking of the faith. And so doctrine was always embodied as a system of theology. And that found expression through uh, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed. And uh, Christian orthodoxy was basically uh, the true church that embraced these biblical doctrines and primarily um, to distinguish themselves from all of the heretics that were uh, running around saying we're part of the church, but, you know, Christ isn't truly God uh, or He wasn't truly man, the, the ascetics, He only appeared as a man. And so the church was always quick to establish its confessions, its creeds, saying this is what is orthodox, this is what is the right way in biblical teaching. How should we deal biblically with separation from a professing Christian who is outwardly involved in sin and part of the covenant community? How should we deal biblically with separating from a professing, professing Christian who is outwardly involved in sin and yet part of the covenant community? Is this a, how should the church deal with Because I think we go to Matthew 18, um, and that's what, 
that's what uh, church discipline is about. A person who's part of the covenant community involved in outward known sin uh, is confronted personally and then confronted with witnesses and then confronted by the church and then excluded from the church. Um, and that's a person with whom we don't even eat. Um, and, and so there is a, a shunning and an exclusion. Um, I, I mean, that, that, that's part of what sets the church apart. But if I as an individual know about somebody that's in gross and heinous sin in the church, and I don't go through those steps, and I become a vigilante d- disciplinarian, no, 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 no. I don't say, I'm not going to have dinner with you, I'm not going to have any fellowship with you. I'm not going to carry out the penalties of excommunication before that person has been excommunicated. That spiritual vigilante. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Sproul, is there a great gulf or a small stream between Wesley and Calvin? Between Wesley and Calvin? Mm -hmm. In what regard? (laughs) Theologically? Theologically. Probably reflecting earlier on our discussion of Romans 9. Listen, Wesley, in my opinion, was a, 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 a true Christian person, a regenerate man. He believed in the essentials of the Christian faith in terms of Christology, in terms of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And so, he had more in in common with with Calvin than he had differences. However, the doctrines of grace, for those who affirm them and those who deny them, are not uh, minor uh, principles. We're talking about the character of God, the doctrine of grace, how a person is saved, and now you're talking about theological differences that are extremely wide and extremely important. I don't think that they are essential for Christian belief, for salvation. I don't think you have to believe in the doctrine of Reformation doctrine, biblical doctrine of election to be saved. And I don't think a church has to believe in the biblical doctrine of election to be a true church. They are, this is not a doctrine that we would say that is of the esse, the essence, but it is a doctrine of the bene esse, the well-being of the church and the well-being at, of the Christian. And a Christian who's trying to work out his, his uh, sanctification, who distances himself from the sweetness of the doctrines of grace is in a perilous, perilous journey. And some who are persistent in their repudiation of the doctrines of grace do so at their everlasting peril. I mean, it may be in the final analysis that what we have here is a heart that is simply hostile towards uh, the majesty of God and towards His sovereignty, and that could be. Uh, you know, like I, when people ask me, can Arminians be saved, I say, oh, yes, barely, <laughs> if they're true Arminians. Uh, but, you know, they may not even hold to what Arminianism, the, the necessary truths that Arminians do hold, uh, really, in their heart of hearts, because they're so hostile to these doctrines. I mean, when I hear Arminian preachers saying that the doctrine of election is a doctrine from hell and it's the doctrine of demons, whew, you know, I'm hearing the Pharisees uh, charging Jesus with casting out Satan by Satan, and he say, watch yourself, boys, you know, you're coming awfully close. And when I hear guys like talk like that, uh, like Jimmy Swagger, you know, who calls it the doctrine of demons and everything. I worry about him, about the state of his soul when he talks like that, when this hostility reaches such great proportion. But I think most true Christians who are not Reformed in their doctrine are not Reformed because they really have struggled honestly. They're afraid that the doctrine of election casts a shadow on the justice and righteousness of God. They're afraid that somehow the true humanity of people is denied. You know, they're working with false premises, and we understand that. But you don't have to be perfect in your theology 
to get into the kingdom of God. You've got to believe in the essentials. But it's an attitude that we have to watch out for here. I, I think, Chris, there's a temptation in the church for us to just be binary on these kind of questions, and we can err on either side. We can say, well, this is not in the Apostles' Creed, and therefore, not only does it not matter, we should never talk about it. We should only talk about the essentials. Then there are those who are binary on the other side saying, any error is damnable heresy, and if you're wrong, you're out. What's interesting about the question is it contrasts across time, uh, and we actually have a, a powerful historical illustration of what Dr. Sproul was saying if we connect with one of those guys. Wesley and Whitfield uh, had in their own lives a, the, the, the outworking of, I think, a tertium quid, an appropriate uh, uh, response to this issue. As you know, the two of them worked very closely together in the whole Methodist movement. They worked together very well in the, in the Great Revival. But eventually, uh, Wesley ended up preaching a sermon that was not quite as bad as Jimmy Swaggart, but it was rather strongly condemnatory of the biblical doctrine of election. Whitfield responded with one of the actual best historical arguments against the Arminian position. It's short, it's well written, uh, it's, I mean, it's easy to read, and it's just really powerful. Wesley's response, excuse me, Whitfield's response to Wesley was just magnificent and gracious. But it was strong. And in that strength, many of Wesley's, or Whitfield's followers pushed even harder such that when Wesley died, they came to him and they said, uh, Dr. Whitfield, do you think you will see Wesley in heaven? And Whitfield, who knew these guys and knew these, these, these young thunder puppies, fire-breathing little dragons, said, uh, no, I don't think I will. And they got their hopes up and they're ready to give each other high fives until he said, no, I don't think I'll see him in heaven. I think he'll be far too close to the throne of glory from where I'll be <laughs> for me to be able to see him. And, uh, you know, I, I think we need to affirm that these errors are exceedingly serious errors, uh, just like our weaknesses and our errors are exceedingly serious weaknesses and errors. Vody, um, you've spoken and written about Christian education. Uh, you're a committed um, home educating family. Um, in, in the circles that you have uh, ministered in, uh, what would you say to parents who are trying to decide between the choice of homeschooling versus bringing their believing students into the public school system uh, and there, thereby, with their Christian faith, being a witness and influence in the public education world? Um, I think they're making a categorical error. And what I mean by that is, on the one side, where well, all of a sudden we went from a discussion about education, which is discipleship, to a discussion about evangelism in spite of negative discipleship. And so it, 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 we, we've got two completely separate categories there. The, the, the question is, should I on the one hand give my child an education that acknowledges Christ's lordship, that seeks to point them toward Christ, that seeks to form in them truths that bring glory and honor and worship to Christ. You see, now we're having a discussion about one category. And then you completely jump to another category and say, or should I have my child who is a believer go have influence on other people who are, whoa, 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 whoa. Over here, we were talking about education, discipleship, and then you completely move to a different category. So what we got to do is we got to talk about those things properly. So on the one hand, let's talk about education and discipleship over here, and then education and discipleship over there. Ask me if, if one of those is appropriate and the other is not. That becomes a very easy question to answer, which is why I think people ask it that way. Because we know that if we ask the question about the same categories, should I 
give my child an education that acknowledges Christ's lordship, points them to Christ's lordship, seeks to form these truths in their life, or should I give them something other than that? That is so easy to answer. So when somebody asks me that question that way, they're telling me that they don't want to answer the most important question. And they've created a false, uh, a, a, a false argument between two separate categories that are being held out in, in competition against one another when they are absolutely not. Because if they ask me, should I give my child a Christ-honoring education or should I have my child be an influence on people who are unbelievers? Yes. <laughs> Why do we assume that the only way a child can have an impact and influence on unbelievers is if they give up on an, a, 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 a Christ-honoring, uh, Christ-centered education? So I think there's a categorical error in the question. One of the great problems we face here is the economic issue where uh, you have to pay for tuition in a Christian school or you can go to the government school for free. Now, the biggest <clears throat> illusion there is sending your kids to government school is free. It's the most costly thing you could ever do, you know. I mean, I, the first question you have to ask is how important are, are, are my children? to me and to the kingdom of God. And, uh, and, I, and also, the other thing that people don't understand is the public schools are not today what they were 50 years ago, 20 years ago even. I mean, it used to be that the local community had a lot to say about it and, and there wasn't this built-in hostility to the truths of the Christian faith. But the government schools today are manifestly opposed to all things Christian. I mean, if you're not reading the paper and see what happens if you try to bear witness to Christ in the, in the public classroom, then you're just, you know, I don't know where you're living or, or what you're reading. But how in the world uh, you would turn your children over to a pagan establishment for their instruction uh, if you really value the, the faith and your children's soul at all is just amazing to me. And I know that that really gets people fired up and angry when I say that, but how else, what else can you say? I mean, the choice is so simple, isn't it? If you really care about discipleship and training of your children. Not what I have to have there, that's all good. <laughs> Many times Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. Uh, two questions really asking similar things here. What does obey really mean in our lives as Christians? And then if we trust in Christ as our Savior, how do we avoid feeling guilty or doubting our own salvation? And then uh, just question mark, but presumably meaning when we disobey, how do we deal with those um, feelings of guilt or doubt about our own salvation. If Christ indeed tells us, if you love me, you will obey me. The simple answer is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you're struggling with doubt, get in the book. Amen. And get in it and get in it and get in it. Because it's there through the Word that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And I don't know any shortcuts to assurance of salvation apart from getting in the Word of God. I'll, I'll give one that I learned from you. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very helpful uh, to people. It's been helpful to me. You understand that, that on the one hand, this, this warning can be very helpful. One of the things that we jump to when we're facing with the problem of assurance is we think that the solution is to make sure everybody's assured, when there may be people that need to not be assured. There may be people that need to be called to embrace the work of Christ. Uh, in fact, all the people do need to be called to embrace the work of Christ, whether they're saved or not. So we need to, 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 to start with the gospel. Now, then we need to understand that the, that the, the strategy of the devil, his, his, his wheelhouse, if you will, is accusation. So that even when you do open up your Bible and you even come to this text, and the devil says, see, see, you don't obey. 
You don't obey. You think you obey? Have you seen you lately? And one of the ironies is, at some level, the Holy Spirit is doing the same thing because when we are in Christ, when we are growing in grace, when the Holy Spirit is at work in us, what do we see more of but our own sin? It is our sinfulness that makes us blind to how sinful we are. It is sanctification which makes us understand how sinful we are. That's why, isn't there a sense in which from a pastoral perspective, the person you worry about is not the one who feels guilt, but the one who doesn't. Right. The one who thinks that they are obeying and thinks that they are just fine because of how wonderfully obedient they're being. See, that's the one uh, as a pastor that, that, you know, it's going to keep me on my face. Um, the other person who's seeing their own sin and continuing to come back to the cross again and again, they've got that, that, that right focus. But the person who thinks, you know, they've got their checklist uh, of the stuff that they're doing um, and, and not worried, um, first of all, their checklist is too small. Um, and, and, and secondly, their standard is too low. Um, so. now, the shortcut I wanted to get to w was this. Dr. Sproul will, will ask a person in this, in this situation, now, do you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul? And even, even the most checklisty person out there is going to have to be able to say, ah, no, I don't think that's me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, the next question is, do you love Him enough? Love Him as much as you want to. What's that? Do you love him as much as you ought to? Do you love him as much as you ought to? Well, no, I don't guess I do love him as much as I ought to. And now they're starting to get thinking, you know, they've met Dr. Gerstner instead of Dr. Sproul. <laughs> Their assurance is shrinking faster than they would like. And the last question is, do you love him at all? One of the blessings of a, of a robust understanding of our own depravity is that it allows you to see the work of God in you. Because without the Spirit at work in my life, I would have no love for Him at all. So if I have some love for Him, that's evidence that the Spirit is at work in me. That's the Spirit speaking to me. And in that love, I do, as the question goes back to, I do cling to His provision and rest in that and not my obedience. And from that, out of that, that uh, indicative of God saying who I am, comes the imperative of how I learn to live my life in obedience to His law. Thank you all so much this afternoon. Let's thank our panelists today. <laughs>